So let's go and start by looking at a normal CT scan. We're going to look at this uncontrasted CT brain. And I'm, I like to start at the vertex and scroll my way down. Some people start at the bottom and scroll their way up. Find a system that's most comfortable for you. And what we want to do here is scroll down slowly and look for any gross uh, abnormalities. Look for midline shift. Look for a large bleed. Look for a mass. And then uh, once we've scrolled through, we can scroll back up and then start looking for specific signs. So you want to look at the sulci here and the gyri. You want to see that there's normal space between them. Now, the more scans you look at, you will realize what's normal for different age groups. You can see that the um, there's no midline shift here. And as we scroll down, we just want to get a general impression of this brain. Are there signs of gross edema? Can we see the normal structures of this brain? We scroll all the way down and then we can scroll back up. I'm going to do this quite quickly, but you would take your time, especially when starting out and learning uh, about uh, the anatomy, especially with a CT brain. So let's start at the top, and I just want to point out some things that are, are really going to be important when we're looking for acute ischemic stroke. What we want to look at here is that the, the white matter in the brain is a lot darker on a CT scan than the gray matter is. Now, it depends on how we window the scan, that the contrast between the two will get more as we narrow that window down. Um, but even uh, on a normal CT scan with normal windowing, we're going to notice that there is some difference between the gray and the white matter. And the gray matter should be a lot lighter than the white matter on the scan, as you can see here. And we're going to go over the vascular territories of the, of the brain but what you want to do, what I like to do, is look at the specific vascular territories one at a time. Look at the anterior uh, cerebral uh, territory, the middle cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral artery, and the cerebellar arteries. And just make sure that that gray-white differentiation is um, apparent throughout uh, the brain. Because when we start to lose that differentiation, that's something that could be uh, due to an, a thromboembolic event. So let's go down. We can see that the gray-white matter differentiation is well maintained throughout this brain. The next area of interest that I want you to look at is know that if we go down, we can start at the sylvian fissure here, follow the sylvian fissure back up, and I want you to look at this insula, which is the lobe that's kind of convoluted inside the brain. It's the only lobe of the brain that's not uh, visible from the outside and it's often forgotten about this insular cortex here within the sylvian fissure and when we're at this level we can also assess the internal capsule here as well as our um, basal ganglia. So if we go down to the bottom of the scan here um, we can start looking at the vascular uh, the vessels uh, supplying the brain and this is an uncontrasted scan, so sometimes it's a bit difficult to actually assess those vessels. But we can start by looking down here. Excuse me, it's not nice to really use an arrow, but I don't actually uh, have a pointer here. We can look at our vertebral arteries coming up to form our basilar artery. That's going to come anterior to the pons, come up as we scroll up, divide into our posterior cere cerebral arteries, um, and then connect with the anterior circulation with our posterior communicating arteries. And our anterior circulation is these two vessels here. It's our internal carotids coming up to then split off into our middle cerebral arteries. Now you can see it's quite difficult to see them here because there's no contrast in them. And those middle cerebral arteries where it bifurcates, the, uh, the second part of the bifurcation is the anterior cerebral artery which is then also uh, joined together to complete the circle of Willis with the anterior communicating arteries. Now I'll show you that in a contrasted scan, so it's a little bit easier. Let's start at the bottom. Okay, we can scroll up. We can see our vertebrals coming together there to form our basilar artery. Now the problem with a contrasted scan is that we can't see changes in density inside a vessel because all the vessels are filled with contrast. So when we're trying to assess for an uh, acute ischemic stroke, it's actually better to start with a non-contrasted scan to be able to see if there's any signs of clot within these vessels. Anyway, so we're going up with our basilar artery here. We want to see that divide giving off our posterior cerebral arteries, sometimes quite difficult to see the posterior communicating artery. And then we look at our internal carotids. Now, ideally, we want to start those internal carotids right down um, from the common carotid and, and work our way up and see that there's no um, signs of aneurysm or anything with inside that uh, internal carotid artery. But we follow it up here. We want to see it split into our middle cerebral artery as well as our anterior cerebral arteries 
I wonder if we can see maybe an anterior communicating artery there um, going off and our anterior vessels go forward. So those are the main arteries that we're going to be looking at uh, within, the, uh, within the cerebrum. And what I find really helpful is this illustration here that's provided on Radiopedia, which color codes the vascular territories um, for the cerebral vessels. And this is something to become really familiar with. And as you start to notice anomalies in the brain that might suggest an acute ischemic stroke, it's good to know which vessel we are suspecting is involved here so that when we go to further investigations, we can specifically look in those regions. And we can ask ourselves, does this sign here on the scan correlate with what my patient has clinically? Now, if we, we know the homunculus on the brain, the legs are in that anterior cerebral artery territory and the arms, face, hands, tongue in the middle cerebral artery territory. So if we've got someone, a patient who's upper limb is affected more than their lower limb, we are clinically suspecting middle cerebral artery territory. And then we can look on our scan and hone in and see, is there any evidence of an acute ischemic stroke on that uh, vascular territory? So I'm gonna scroll through here briefly. Now I'm gonna link these cases below. So if you want to take your time and scroll through them yourself, you can go by looking at the cerebral arteries and the cerebellar arteries and seeing which parts of the brain each artery um, supplies. And this is something that needs to become second, uh, needs to become very, like, very clear to you. You need to know it like the back of your hand. You want to know these territories without having to go back and look it up. You, the more scans you look at, the more you're gonna appreciate where these vessels actually supply the brain. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time here. I'm gonna go on and I'm gonna actually show you some 3D anatomy because often we are presented this in medical school. We've got this 2D picture of the circle of Willis and it's quite difficult to appreciate where these vessels are going. Now I want to show you some real images that are gonna show us in a 3D manner where these uh, vessels are going and how they're supplying the brain. But we're gonna start with our um, vertebral arteries that are coming from our from their respective subclavian arteries they're going to come up and join the basilar we would have given off our posterior inferior um, cerebellar artery our anterior inferior cerebellar artery our basilar is then going to come up give us our superior cerebellar artery and then the circle of willis like we've described going back our um, posterior uh, cerebral arteries and our uh, posterior communicating arteries which is going to join with our anterior circulation which is our internal carotids coming up bifurcating into our middle cerebral and our anterior cerebral and communicating in the middle of the two anterior cerebrals by an anterior communicating artery so let's see that represented in a 3d manner and this is what really helped me to kind of uh, visualize these is by looking at some reformatted reconstructed arterial phase images and uh, appreciating that that circle of Willis that we see in that 2D plane is actually bent over and we've got basically four legs supplying our um, posterior and anterior circulation. We've got our vertebral arteries as two legs and our internal carotids as the other two legs and we can see how they join. So let's start by following our vertebral arteries. It's a bit of a tortuous uh, course here on both sides, but it's a nice place to start because we can identify them nice and easily because they join up to form a single basilar artery. So we've got our one vertebral artery and another vertebral artery coming up to form our basilar artery, which is gonna then bifurcate and give off our posterior cerebral arteries. So that is our posterior circulation. We're supplying our um, occipital region as well as um, we've got cerebellar arteries that are coming off our vertebrals and our basilar, which are gonna provide the blood supply to the cerebellum. Then we can follow the course of our internal carotid arteries. Now this is, there's very specific anatomy to this that we're not gonna go through here, but we follow them up. That should then bifurcate into our anterior cerebral artery as well as our middle cerebral, uh, cerebral artery. And understanding this is crucial to understanding where the um, territories we need to focus our attention are when we're looking at a CT scan. And uh, this is a, a beautiful piece of evolutionary um, I don't know, but beautiful piece of evolution where you can see how a blockage in one of these uh, segments or one of these arteries will then allow blood to course and flow through this circle of Willis and compensate for that blood loss. So we can um, survive a stroke. If, there was, if these circulations were completely separate, we would completely lose those vascular territories without any compensation from the uh, other circulation. So let's go on to 
uh, DSAs, Digital Subtraction and Geography. And I find this scanning, first of all, beautiful, but second of all, very informative as to um, how these vessels actually perfuse the brain. And because these images give us a live stream of how, how the vessel then uh, supplies the blood to the brain. So if you haven't seen these images before, what we're doing is basically taking x-rays, layering them on top of each other and injecting contrast as we take those x-rays and then taking away the Im all those x-ray images from one another and only keeping what has changed, which is our contrast going through the image. So we can see this is the posterior portion of our skull. We've got a cervical vertebra here. And what we do is we've got our dye injecting here, that tortuous vertebral artery that's then giving blood up. We can see our posterior uh, inferior uh, cerebellar artery, as well as our anterior inferior cerebellar artery. As, as dye goes further, we've got our superior cerebellar artery coming off our basilla, which is here. And then we got the basilla bifurcating into our posterior um, cerebral arteries. And then you can see how this beautifully perfuses the brain like that. And how this is called the posterior circulation. Our vertebral arteries are supplying our cerebellum as well as our um, cerebrum. Most, most importantly, the occipital region of the cerebrum. And then we can go to our anterior circulation. We can look here at the left internal carotid. Um, we start again. We see our skull here. This is anterior here. This is posterior. We see our um, dye being injected coming up to the internal uh, carotid and then that bifurcating into the middle and anterior cerebral arteries perfusing uh, extremely large portion of the cerebrum. You can see here just how much of the cerebrum comes from the anterior circulation. And this MCA is the most common uh, place for a thromboemboli to then come, come and lodge in that vessel and cause an acute ischemic event. So now I've, I've really hashed home the vascular supply of the brain. We can start looking at some uh, pathology here. And again, we can start at the top of our brain, scroll down slowly. This, this is slightly, this is windowed slightly more, um, slightly narrower so that we can see that differentiation between the gray and the white matter. And what we want to do is slowly scroll down and see if we can follow this uh, gray matter around the, around the brain and see if there's any areas that that uh, gray matter differentiation is lost. And if I stop the image there, we can see that we, it's very difficult to see where white matter starts and gray matter ends here. And so we can see in this whole territory here, we may have, we've lost our gray white matter differentiation as opposed to on the left side of the patient here, we can still see that uh, uh, gray white matter interface. So let's scroll further, further down, further inferior. You can see our head of the chordate here, head of our chordate here, it should be a lentiform nucleus. It's a bit more difficult to see the lentiform there. And uh, so we may have lost some of that basal ganglia. And we scroll further down. We want to look at our vasculature. And here is our first sign that I want to uh, kind of bring home. And that's called the hyper, hyper dense artery sign or hyper intense artery sign. What we can see here is that our MCA is shining bright here. There's no contrast in this vessel. This is a clot now, which is denser than blood. And it's, the clot has spent time forming wherever it's coming from, if it's coming from the heart or uh, the internal carotids. And that, that clot is now much more dense than blood. It gets shot off to the brain and it gives us this hyperdense artery on the brain. And we can see it here, a, a massive uh, clot within this MCA. On the corresponding side, that vessel or in the basilar artery is our normal density and we've got this dense MCA here. So here we've got an MCA territory infarct. Our first sign is that hyperdense artery sign. Then as we go up, we can see our second sign, which is loss of gray white matter differentiation. And our third sign is loss of um, basal ganglia differentiation here. It's very difficult to see the lentiform nucleus here. We've got effacement of those basal ganglia. I'm gonna go on to our next case and our last case. I don't want to show too many cases here, but I want to show you how these signs look uh, on two different scans. And then uh, we, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna not commentate this scan. I hopefully I'm gonna scroll through it slowly, see if you can see these signs, and then I'm gonna show you the signs on still images to finish off the talk. 
So I'm going to start this time at the bottom. And we're just going to scroll up slowly. As we're scrolling up, now these are uncontrasted scans. It's quite difficult to see the vessels, but hopefully uh, it's going to jump out at you. Perfect. So we've seen everything we need to see. I'm going to go back down and I'm going to talk you through this case. So we're starting uh, at the base of the skull here. We can scroll up. We can see our basilla and we can see our internal carotid uh, arteries. Uh, quite difficult to see on this scan, but we, as we scroll up, as we scroll up, we can see our normal basilla. We look for now our internal carotids. And as we scroll up, we can see another hyperdense MCA here. And we can actually follow this as a long clot. As we, as we scroll up, we see it's still there, still dense. We go into the sylvian fissure. We can still see that uh, artery quite clearly coming down and move my cursor away here. And we can see that it extends all the way up into the sylvian fissure, into the insula here. And so because the MCA is one of, is the most common uh, region for a uh, thromboembolic uh, emboli or stroke, that loss of gray white matter differenti differentiation very commonly happens here on the insular cortex. We, we, we talked about the insula earlier, the lobe that's hidden away. Um, and so on the right hand side of the patient here, you can still see that gray matter quite bright here and we've lost that here. It's a dark gray matter. We can't see the differentiation between that gray and white matter. And uh, as we scroll up, we can see the chordate much better on the right hand side. We uh, are struggling to see that differentiation on the left hand side um, of our basal ganglia here, here. So we've also had our disappearing basal ganglia sign. Whereas on the right hand side, we can see the internal capsule coming through. We can see the chordate head can see the lentiform nucleus and the thalamus much better than we had previously. So I'm going to show you those images windowed slightly differently and just as still images. So here we can see that on the right hand side we've got our normal density of our MCA. Here we've got a hyper dense MCA sign. We can go uh, to our insular ribbon. We can see here that there's still bright uh, gray matter on the right insula where we've lost that on the insula of the, of the left gray matter. And we can see here that our basal ganglia here are dark. It's much more difficult to see than on the right-hand side. Now, for me, the first time seeing these signs, they were much more subtle than I thought they would be. And um, if you're not looking specifically for those signs, you're going to miss them quite easily. And uh, I would highly recommend that if you see a sign, try and, if you can, reformat that image into a sagittal plane or a coronal plane to confirm that the, these uh, signs are in fact truly what they what they're showing. So you can have a hyper intense signal in a or a hyper dense signal in a um, vessel, and when you uh, reformat that into another plane, you can see that that, that was maybe due to um, the angle of the vessel being cut uh, by the X-rays. Getting a little bit more into X-ray physics that I don't actually want to touch on here. But basically what I want to get across is if you're not looking at these specific regions, if you're not looking at the basal ganglia, the insular cortex, you're not looking for gray white matter differentiation, and you're not following those arteries up, you're going to miss signs of an acute ischemic stroke. So I hope that helped. It's a little bit all over the place. I do all these videos in one take, so um, there's no editing that goes on afterwards. So sorry if I muddled my words a little bit, but if that has helped you, please let me know in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel for more videos like these, and I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.